Join us, friends. Great Scott, small guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, small guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the spa guy, and it is not Trey. He is not here. He is on location filming, but we wish that he was. But we're going to talk about Wickwam anyhow, and I don't think I even said it in the last episode with uh, Daniel and Kerry, but we are not Wickwam. We're not wishing cop was a monkey, but we know that a lot of people are. So I'm going to bring them in and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just how wigwam the world is. And uh, in this particular story, uh, we're going to talk about this is a continuation. This is part two with Daniel and Carrie. And what we were talking about was the Natalie Wood homicide is what I'm going to start calling it from here on. Um, and the so. Trey and I, to, to set this up for uh, a lot of you, uh, Elvis was a big James Dean fan. James Dean was Elvis's Elvis. And, of course, in the movie Rebel Without a Cause, uh, Natalie Wood was opposite James Dean. He also had another friend of Elvis's, um, uh, Nick Adams. Nick Adams, And yeah. I just found something recently. I was doing, I was editing some of my King Creole stuff from New, uh, New Orleans, and I did not realize that Dummy in King Creole was also in Rebel Without a Cause. Oh, really? He was, he was one of the guys in oh, the Leather Jackets. Yeah, yeah, same guy. Oh, wow. And he's still alive. He's 92. So I'm looking for him oh, wow. to do an interview. Awesome. And uh, so I just thought that was a nice tie. Just like y'all alluded yeah. to in the other, in the last video, you can, it's really, really odd that you can find an Elvis tie of some sort in almost everything. Almost right. And yeah. it's really yeah. bizarre. When you start <laughs> thinking about it, it's like, okay, so this person and that. And so anyway, what I was going to tell yeah. y'all is Trey and I, the last time we were in LA, which was just a few months ago, um, there's a scene where we love James Dean too. And I know y'all do too. He's just, you know, he's a, he's an icon, sure. you know, he's a fascinating uh, character. And yeah, in the movie really Rebel really. Without a Cause, oh, that's right. That's, yeah, you got, right here. <laughs> there you go. Look at that. Okay. So I'm not that big of a fan, but <laughs> so, so we went to the opening of Rebel Without a Cause. James is laying on the pavement playing with the car. Y'all remember that? Like a doll and all that. And there's a house behind him. So we went there, which is just off of Hollywood Boulevard and filmed that house. It's still there. Oh, wow. And talk about that scene. And then there's a scene where James is coming out of his the back of his house by the garage, and he walks out. Natalie Wood walks out the back of her house, and he's talking to the, to her as they're walking down the alley towards the road where her friends are going to pick her up. And uh, one of the people that was in the car, two of the people, was Nick Adams, and also from Easy Rider, Dennis um, Hopper. Dennis Hopper, which roomed with Nick Adams. They were roommates. And so she hops in that car and they drive off. And then James Dean gets in his car, gets out of the garage and comes. That alley and all those houses and garages are all still there. Oh, so wow. We went there and filmed wow. that where they're walking cool. and doing all of that. It's very, very cool. Looks just like it did. There's <sighs> even this white metal, um, like a guardrail thing. And it's... It, you see it with James Dean and it's still there. The garage is still there. Yeah. Now, sadly, the guy that lived in the house that James Dean lived in, in the movie, which they filmed at that house, you know, he lifts the garage door and pulls his car out. That guy was a turd. He was mad that we were there and cussed at Trey. Oh no. All kind of stuff. The guy that lived in Natalie Wood's house was very nice. Huh. And, um, you know, so you just never know what you're going to do. You never know. Yeah. yeah. So um, y'all have investigated the Natalie Wood, Robert Wagner homicide, okay? And and we alluded to a couple of different things I want to bring back up that, uh, can you do a Christopher Walken? No, I can't. <laughs> can you, Daniel? No, I don't. I, um, I, I, I've been working on my Robert Wagner, but I don't, I can't okay. do Christopher Walken. Well, I probably, I'm going to try Christopher Walken. It's going to be terrible, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> He would do this and it would be Natalie Wood. And, you know, so that was terrible. <laughs> but it's, he does his cadence type way. Yeah. That he oh, yeah. And that's him. 
you know, okay. and he also yeah. looks yeah. weird yeah. on top of all that. But it's just the way that he, this cadence that he uses when he talks right. that makes him who he is. And so for those of you that don't know who Christopher Walken is, he's the real weird looking dude with a giant forehead. And, <laughs> uh, and he has this odd cadence that he uses. And he's basically the same character in every movie. He's basically himself now. Yeah, um, he's he, himself in every movie. Yeah, he's yeah. Kind of, <laughs> <laughs> so, but he was on the boat that day. Yes, so yes. y'all take us back to, and the reason that uh, you mentioned earlier, Carrie, that this story was kind of wickwam in the fact that there's books written that tell the story one way. And then that same person wrote a book that told the story a different way, or she started changing facts, started changing people's testimony to kind of, pushed to her to her narrative, which yeah, yeah. is wrong on its face. And that's what Wickwam is about. For instance, when I'm making videos and y'all make YouTube videos and y'all have a YouTube channel and let's go ahead and plug it again. It's Trav Elvis, like Travel yeah. Elvis, T-A-R-V Elvis. Yeah. And so the thing is, is when you're doing videos, now I will say this uh, from my standpoint is there's things that I hear in the Elvis community or Elvis stories when I've interviewed someone that I don't believe to be true, or it's a negative connotation towards Elvis that will never see the light of day on my channel. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's not true. I just don't do negative Elvis stories. Sure. Um, yeah. so right. I will, it's, it's maybe that's right. Maybe it's not right, but I'm not, I'm not out to hurt Elvis's image, especially he's gone. He has no way of protecting himself, yeah. but there's things that I hear that you'll never hear me say on a video that I know uh, to be factual. But there's also things that I hear from people that I know are not factual. And you even alluded to it, Carrie, off camera, uh, talking about that you talk to a person and you start realizing, well, now I know that what you just said is not right. But I also know that some of the things they do say are right. Yeah. So um, let's let's go ahead and get into the Robert Wagner, uh, Natalie Wood thing. And, at, and after that, let's kind of dig into Wickwam in the Elvis community, if you will. Oh, when sure, you're trying sure. to navigate those treacherous waters, which are very hard to navigate. <laughs> very. And uh, whew, wow, what a, what a crazy thing. <laughs> and I didn't even know it was a thing. When I started making Elvis videos, I thought, what you saw was what you got, and it's not that way at all. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a crazy field. thing. And yeah. uh, so tell us a little bit about, take us back and, and fill in the blanks with the Natalie Wood, Robert Wagner story. Y'all talk about that they went and ate at a place and kind of tell us all, fill in the blanks of the story. Sure, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting that you started out talking about Christopher Walken because he's a pretty key player in the trajectory of what happened that weekend, just kind of setting up to the mood and the dynamics of what were going on. Um, so Natalie and Christopher Walken had filmed a movie called Brainstorm together, um, or they were in the process of filming it. Um, the accident took place um, Thanksgiving weekend, 1981. Um, and so they were still in the process of filming Brainstorm in North Carolina. Um, they, they broke for the holiday. Natalie had invited Christopher to join her and RJ. Um, we always call him RJ, Robert Wagner. Um, <laughs> but um, to, to join them on the boat, they had invited some other friends to, to, to go on their boat, The Splendor, um, out on Catalina Island. Um, and there had been some dynamics brewing um, leading up to this between Robert Wagner, Christopher Walken, and Natalie. Um, it's interesting. You you kind of talked about the Christopher Walken that we know of today, who's sort of this weird, quirky mm -hmm. guy, you know, um, who kind of just does like a cameo of himself in every movie at this mm -hmm. point, you know. Um, but back then, you know, we're coming, we're, we're back... Um, Going to 1981, he was fresh off the movie The Deer Hunter, which he had won an Oscar for. Um, he was a like New York stage method trained actor. Um, so he was somebody that Natalie really looked up to. She had been out of the film business for a while. She was looking to get back into movies again and revive her career. Um, she really admired him as a serious actor, the kind of um, performer she wanted to be. And so she became quite enamored with him. And when I say enamored, I don't necessarily mean in a romantic sense, um, but she really but, admired but him. He as was an like actor. a leading man type character at this time. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, because yeah. I always think of him like you just mentioned. He's just kind of a cameo character that popped right. out. Well, back I, didn't, then, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. back then it was all 
you know, in front of him, you know, and he was, he was actually handsome back then. And, you know, it was all looking good. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he had just won an Oscar. Um, so he had a really promising seemingly career ahead of him at that point. And he hadn't really quite been pigeonholed into just kind of Christopher Walken, this weird guy. Um, I don't know if anybody saw like his Super Bowl commercial uh, where he just, it's just one big extended cameo where he's joking off of his voice and his image <laughs> and all of that. So, I mean, that's definitely how people think of him these days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so it's interesting going back, you know, to, to at that point, um, Natalie, like I said, she had kind of stepped away from the film industry for a while to raise her children. Um, she was looking to restart her career. Uh, she was a little out of the loop, you know, and she really admired him. She did the movie Brainstorm because he was going to be her leading man in it. And so she had developed a friendship with him. She admired him a great deal. Um, this made Robert Wagner very jealous. Um, yeah. He felt that there was something romantic happening between the two of them. And so he had already at that point when they were filming Brainstorm in North Carolina, he had gone to North Carolina and caused problems and jealousies had already erupted. So lots of things were happening leading up to Thanksgiving weekend of 1981. Where was uh, it filmed in North Carolina? Do you know? Wilmington or? Um, was it Raleigh Durham, Daniel? Do you remember? I'll dig into that. Hang on, and, uh, I think Daniel. Uh, got... Yeah, no, it was you. You got stopped for a second. Yeah. <laughs> you you... Rich, Daniel. Um, what was the last thing you said? You asked a question. Was it filmed in Raleigh, Durham? Brainstorm. Uh, yeah, I believe it was. Um, and yeah. and actually, um, RJ, see, RJ had, um, he had been in her shadow because uh, he had never quite, I mean, he was famous. He was in movies, but he, he wasn't at the top echelon. And so he, lived in her shadow for quite a while and it was a big uh, source of friction in their marriage. And they divorced and remarried. Um, and about that time he went to TV again and heart to heart was being filmed and that was a huge success. So now he's the, 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 the breadwinner and he's feeling good about himself and she's staying home and raising kids. And now she wants to get back into the movies and he, this is a big threat to his ego. Uh, he liked things the way they were. And so he was kind of against it anyway. And he was convinced something was going on between her and, um, and Walken. And he actually went to uh, North Carolina and dropped in unannounced uh, to try to catch them in something. And apparently there was an altercation there in a restaurant. Uh, and I actually found a, a, a photo uh, of him, RJ, and Natalie Wood on the set. And, you know, she's kind of pointing stuff out, like showing him the set and stuff. And it's funny because he looks very angry. I mean, he looks unamused. And, um, and she seems a little like, you know, a little catering to him a little bit. So reading a lot into the photo, but I thought it was a telling photo. He wasn't even trying to hide the fact that he was... Uh, not pleased. But so all this stuff happened and people knew about it, but yet she invited him out with them on for Thanksgiving on the boat, even though the weather was going to be bad and some other people begged off. Uh, but one person said he didn't go, well, a good friend of theirs, because uh, he didn't want to put up with listening to RJ and walk and fight. So it was known that they were having problems. So it was very odd that somehow or another, these four people found themselves on that boat that night, you know. Um, how large of a boat was this? How, how large? Yeah. it was. It's a 60-foot uh, yacht. So that's a big boat. 60 it's, feet is a big boat, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a big boat. I mean, they were comfortable on that boat, but, uh, but it was just the four of them. And, and the reason I was asking that was if she went overboard and walking could have been somewhere where he didn't hear her because – in my mind, before we started talking about this, I I kind of thought that maybe RJ and Walken were buddies and he didn't want to get involved. But now I'm seeing that it was actually Walken and her were friends. And so where was he at the time when all this went on? Well, that's, yeah, that's a really interesting aspect of it. So it, it, it is an established thing that. Um, that night, before they went back to the boat, they were at the only restaurant on Catalina, um, which is a place called Doug's Harbor Reef. Well, in um, two harbors. In two harbors, yeah. Um, and y'all ate there. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. we had lunch there. Yeah. So you have a we, video about that. Yeah. Yeah. We've we've got a we've got a video with all that uh, the bar that they were at the table that they probably sat at and we we uh, we went there. There's a picture of her and RJ on the wall. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they they had also as a group had an argument the previous evening um, on the boat. So tensions were brewing. Um, you know, this was something that apparently was just really mounting as the weekend went on. But they were all at Doug's Harbor Reef that evening. Um, an argument and there was a lot of heavy drinking. Um, an argument had ensued. It, it got very it got to the point where other diners noticed that there was tension. It was getting loud. They were making a scene. So there was, was you know, Martin some established. What's that? Was Christopher with them? Oh, yeah. 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 So the three was of all four. And then there. Uh, oh, and the captain. OK. Yeah. Dennis yeah. Davern, who was the skipper on the boat. They, they He was right. in the employ of the uh, Wagners. But he was eating with them. It was four of them. Yes. Yeah. And they were all eating and drinking. Yes. A lot of drinking, apparently. Um, Which the and, captain shouldn't have been drinking, but. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Apparently they were hitting it pretty hard. Yeah. 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 And the part of the argument. When they that... left, the, the uh, owner of the restaurant called ahead and said, keep an eye on them. Make sure they make it to the boat. All right. Because they've, they've been hitting it pretty hard. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's very dramatic what had happened that night. All the other diners saw it. That's that's been established. Um, and the the source of the argument um, was that, as Daniel mentioned, Robert Wagner was not very happy about Natalie wanting to get back into acting again. Um, he had his success on Heart to Heart. He really did not want to be in a position where he was being overshadowed by her again. Um, and so he really resented the fact that Christopher Walken was encouraging her to focus on her career, to kind of put that first. Um, he, at that point, Christopher Walken was somebody who, you know, apparently took his career very seriously. It was the most important thing to him. He had a very strong work ethic around it. Um, and so he was really encouraging Natalie to do the same at that point, um, which, angered RJ very much, you know, he also suspected that there was something romantic going on between them as well. So it was just a lot of different things happening there. Um, this continued when they got back to the boat. Um, RJ became angered, broke a wine bottle on the table, yelled at Christopher Walken. Um, at that point, Christopher Walken said so the official story, and this is where it gets interesting. I think most people who have, you know, read about the story through the years and are familiar with it, the, the canon version of this is that after the argument, Christopher Walken excused himself, went to his room, fell asleep, didn't hear anything else that happened that night, was just completely oh. MIA. Um, and I think most people have accepted that as, you know, the official version of events, that he didn't see anything, didn't hear anything, didn't really have anything to offer. Um, but when you really look at the layout of the boat and where his bedroom was, in, you know, in contrast to where this had occurred, the deck of the boat um, and the, you know, the alleged noise that they were making during the argument and the other ear witnesses, there's just really no way. Um, that he could have slept through that, not heard it, um, you know, so it definitely cross, it definitely sheds some doubt over the official story that we've been told for all these years. But it depends on how much he drank as well. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. Also, there's also evidence through testimony and stuff um, that puts him on the deck. Stuff that he said in interviews with the investigator, such as it was, because, uh, the investigator's initial interview with Robert Wagner lasted six minutes and then they just let him go. And wow. what, and walking, who knows how long he talked to him. It was comparable, but in going back, they found stuff that he said that puts him outside of his him there instead of the bedroom. Yes. Interesting. Okay. This book right here. I don't know if you can see it. Yes. Brainstorm. It's uh, this is a book we were talking about in the last episode that was written by Sam Peroni. And if you're interested in his investigation, um, this book, you know, is if you think you know the story, read this because this guy, you know, is the real deal. He was a um, state's attorney, you know, um, U.S. attorney and uh, assistant attorney in Arkansas, prosecutor, uh, defense attorney, investigator you know, for I don't know how many decades, but he knows what he's doing. And he treated this just like he like a prosecutor would in their investigation, getting ready for a uh, case. And I mean, he subpoenaed, he sued the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department 
for access to files. Uh, he had people deposed and they had to come in. Um, witnesses, uh, people who are connected with the case, the author that we were talking about who wrote her book, books about it, uh, finding inconsistencies. So, I mean, he's, he's deep dived on this thing for quite a while and he's uncovered things that it, they just don't add up, you know. Um, what do you think happened? Well, with Christopher. With, with Christopher, well, he thinks that Christopher at some point was definitely on that deck in not not necessarily when the fight was happening, but when she was gone, no longer on the boat, uh, he said things that places him on the deck. Mm -hmm. And that totally contradicts what he's been telling the uh, sheriff's department for decades. Because uh, his story was, I was in my cabin, that's it. I don't know nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, which was, you know, probably a good way to go. But um, but not only is it kind of hard to believe, but some of the stuff he said doesn't support it. Um, and, you know, what they did was they got interviewed for five or six minutes, jumped on a, a, a chopper, went to the mainland and lawyered up immediately um, and mm. clammed up. And then from there on, you know, the investigation was just it was there was no investigation. It was, you know, and I alluded to it before. I mean, it's all in the book, but I mean. But Robert the, uh, could have told him, you know, she went to the bedroom. You know, she went overboard, but he could have told Christopher she went to the bedroom or whatever. Or, or you know, so there's so many things that could have happened. But, wow, I said I didn't realize it. See, I love these details. Well, one there's, thing. Look, there's, there's photographs of the crime scene and evidence that he points out. I mean, it's, it's pretty thorough. Yeah. That's interesting is when the case was reopened, um, Christopher Walken immediately lawyered up and went to talk to the police. Um, and they have alluded to the fact that he did tell them new information. Um, I think he told it to them on the guise of, if I tell you this, you know, I want to be kind of immune to whatever happens moving forward, um, that kind of thing. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we know that he did tell the police new information, presumably things that might have contradicted his original story. Um, you know, so that's an interesting fact, too. It's unknown exactly what he told them um, or if we'll ever know that for sure. Um, but uh, but there is reason to believe that 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 he did go back and, and share some things that he probably hadn't the first time. So when they were doing this investigation, y'all were telling me that um, it basically it almost looks like a cover up at some oh, point. Yeah. So tell us about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that was known uh, for a while, you know, and this was in the book, Natasha, as well, was that the the investigation into her death, as it were, we use the term investigation loosely in this case, but essentially it was halted by Frank Sinatra, who was a good friend of both of the Wagners, um, had a long and somewhat sordid history with Natalie going back to when she was a teenager. Um and so he was close with them. He had reason to be vested in this. Um, Guess who else he was close friends with? Hmm. The sheriff. Yes. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Very close friends. Very close friends with the sheriff. And it's interesting. There's a lot of things that like. And also the mafia. Basically. The mafia. Oh, that's <laughs> no exactly joke. where we're going. <laughs> no <joke. with> this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if it gets deeper and deeper, right? This, uh, was it the, uh, that Stanley guy who was married to, uh, was married to Jill St. John. I mean, it just goes on and on. But uh, but Frank Sinatra wrote a letter when okay. when when Thomas the coroner Thomas Noguchi came out and said way too much, and uh, and was really steering like 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 uh, the bums rushed towards you know this is an accident 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 you know you know alcohol driven and all this stuff and um, you know. Uh, Frank Sinatra heard this and is just like, you know what? He's talking too much. He wrote a letter to the sheriff um, and basically said, you know, Thomas Noguchi needs to be seen and not heard. And all of a sudden they back off of it. And that sheriff kept that letter on his wall for th like 30 years. He had it framed. He's very proud of his connection here with uh, Sinatra. But yeah, they, they totally... You know, it goes into old Hollywood and the fixers and all the stuff that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, they looked after those, they're their own, you know. Yeah, so, I Terry, mean, tell I mean, us about the letter. 
<laughs> well, it's like you hear these stories about like that kind of a L.A. confidential and sort of these what we think are fictitious stories about the relationship between um, the LSAD, the mob, Hollywood, you know, back at that time. And, you know, a lot of times that sounds very sensationalistic. But actually, you know, that's a big real of in this case. Yeah. 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 There was a very strong connection between the authorities, the mob, Hollywood. You know, they were all in bed together. Frank Sinatra was in bed with all of them at the same time. You know, he had connections <laughs> with all of the, with, with all of these things. And so, um, you know, and, and also the fixers in Hollywood, people who would make things go away, you know, make legal issues go away for celebrities and things like that. Um, we're going back now to the studio system when, you know, you were property of the studio if you were a movie star. They owned you. They could make or break you. You know, they, they made up your whole identity for you. And if they didn't want something to be in the press, they made sure that it never got there. Um, you know, so very different time. But interestingly, even in the early 80s, there were still a lot of vestiges of this. A lot of those mobsters were still around. Frank Sinatra was still somebody that had a lot of pull and power within that system. Um, the sheriff was somebody who had been implanted there for years and had a long time history with Frank Sinatra. Um, you know, and so just just so much history, you know, between all these forces. And this was a case that kind of intersected with all of them, um, you know, in just the right way to get it to, to vanish. Um, so y'all said that this letter was on the wall of the sheriff for 30 years, but when the guy that wrote this book asked for it, tell us about that. It mysteriously got misplaced. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's gone, huh? Yeah. It just vanished into thin air and nobody knew what happened yeah, to it. That was one of the that was one of the things that Sam uh, had wanted to have subpoenaed um, to to be evidence, you know, because he he sued and got the LSAD to um, LASD to you know share information and stuff. But he also uh, had witnesses subpoenaed and and evidence, and he wanted that. And uh, suddenly, it's missing, you know. So that so if uh, anybody out there uh, in Radio Land has a photograph of that letter. We want to know about it. So email. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anybody yeah. knows anything about that letter? <laughs> anything. It didn't just, I mean, there's somebody that has a letter, a copy of it, a photograph of it or something. Or the original, you know, yeah. Yeah. Or the, original. I mean, I, the, the, the uh, sheriff's name escapes me right now, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's what was it? His last name was Purchase. Pritchess, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, him, him and Sinatra were like that, you know, and I mean, it, it's probably in his family or something, you know, or else it was destroyed. You know, that could be, too. But uh, but yeah, if anybody had any a picture of it or or any knowledge, or just any knowledge of it, of it yeah, um, anything, you know, yeah. so y'all believe that is a straight cover up at this point that that I do that he well, was, was yeah. guilty, probably of. And this is opinion now, what we're talking about right now is sure. he yeah. was probably guilty of homicide and the the machine went in and took care of it. And yeah. he's still alive, by the way. Robert Wagner, was he 93? Yeah, now? he just, 93. Yeah, he just got a birthday. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I, I want to mention, too, um, incidentally, um, one of the things that he covers in the book, he goes into the legal standards and, you know, we've got we've got one video that talks about why it's homicide and mm -hmm. and part of the key to that is in california you know he doesn't have to he didn't have to push her into the water or force her into the water maybe he did but he didn't have to if they were having some kind of argument or or, or interaction and she fell in the water even if she slipped on her of her own accord and he knows that she's in the water and he doesn't help to save her in California, he's guilty of homicide. And that would include Christopher Walken as well. If he was aware. Right. Um, if if yeah. he was aware or if he was involved right. in yeah. the events where she wound up in the water. And again, it doesn't have to be that they caused her to go in the water. It just has to have happened while they were there. They were involved in the events. And they, then they don't save her. It's homicide. Yeah, he almost, be, almost like be, the Good Samaritan law, you know, where if yeah. you don't step in and help someone. Yeah, yeah, and in, in most places you're on you're under no legal duty to help them. Right, you're under a moral duty, you could argue, but yeah. legally, if you didn't 
save the drowning person there. It's, you know, but at least in California at that time, you know, if you had something to do with what she was involved in at the time and she went in the water and you don't save her, it's homicide. So at the very least, it's homicide on those grounds. And who knows what actually happened because she had over 30 bruises all over her body. Mm. Um, and she didn't get that this in was the water. Like assault. Yeah. She didn't get that in water. Yeah. Absolutely. And the LSAD have acknowledged that in, in their reopening. Um, you know, they, they have stated that she appeared to be the victim of an assault. Um, they did change the cause of death to drowning and other unnamed factors mm. um, from accidental drowning. So I think that ha more or less, you know, I mean, it's almost like we get these mixed messages from the authorities in this case mm -hmm. because they pretty much said, yeah, we, we know what happened, but yet um nothing will ever come of it well if he point. was dead they would have probably done something different they would have probably said homicide or whatever you know but him still living yeah and the other thing that mr peroni talks about in his book is as far as premeditation goes that doesn't have to be something where before they were on the boat robert wagner had planned this and contrived it and had it all mapped out it, it could be if he you know, had the thought of, I'm going to push you. And five minutes later he did, um, that actually legally constitutes premeditation. Hmm, um, you know, so that's an interesting fact oh, too that I don't think most yeah. people realize. Oh, what were we going to say, Daniel? Well, what you, you made an excellent point there. I wanted to, to, to expand on it because one of the things that I found to be, I mean, not shocking is a strong word, but it, it surprised me was that there was a possible component of premeditation, even, you know, if it didn't pan out the way I described, yeah. Um, and there's and and one of the things that Sam says is you look for motive. Well, guess what? There's motive mm -hmm. because she had the money. He remarried her probably in part for money. And he was doing really well with heart to heart. But, you know, that show is not going to last forever. She there's evidence that she was going to divorce him. Um, she's going to take him to the cleaners. This has already happened once. He doesn't want to be humiliated again because, you know, he managed to keep a lid on the root cause of the first divorce, uh, which was her finding him with another man. But, um, but in this course, tell, tell me that again. I'll tell you that again. Yeah. She found him with the butler. And okay. that's why they got divorced. I that's what you just said. It is, yeah. <laughs> I want to and, make sure uh, I heard that right. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, and, tell you this too, in case you haven't heard it. In his own book, he put out a book, uh, Robert did, uh, Pieces of My Heart. It was his memoir. And, uh, and he states in there that he was jealous of her and Warren Beatty when uh, they were making um, Splendor in the Grass together. And he says of himself that he was so jealous that he pulled up outside uh, Warren Beatty's house one night with a gun and was waiting for him. He was going to kill him. Wow. And uh, he said, you know, cool, my cooler head prevailed and I didn't do it. But he tells that on himself, you know, in his autobiography. So he, he acknowledges a problem with jealousy. Uh, but and Warren but, Beatty lived... Uh, never mind. I, I was going to say, I think he lived next to Clint Eastwood, but that may, it may not be him. It may be uh bullet. Um, Steve, uh, McQueen. Steve McQueen, I think yeah, lived yeah. next to, uh, uh, I mix Steve McQueen and Warren Beatty up a little bit. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of stuff there that has to do with money. That's very strange motive, and yeah. it speaks directly to motive. And he wasn't really, RJ wasn't really a, a superstar actor until he played number two in Austin Powers. That's my <laughs> opinion. That's when it really turned for him. I mean, yeah. I think that was his <laughs> finest hour. <laughs> yeah, it was his finest hour. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to bring a little levity to this because <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I I've always liked Robert Wagner. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, I I'm not guy. going into this like I hate Robert Wagner. But uh, but you know, it's like you can't unsee this stuff. Yeah. And I still kind of like him, but I yeah. I just I think he's not. I think he's culpable of something. Yeah. Well, I mean, we yeah. hope that nobody could do that to another human being, especially someone, especially a female as a male or someone that you love. But the reality is, is people do that to other people. Yeah. Sadly. 
you know. Well, if you're you're out of you're blasted out of your mind and you're jealous anyway, and everybody else is drunk, and he was, you know, he was exhibiting a lot of strange behavior that night. Yeah. I mean, things happen. You it's know. a bad situation. It, yeah, it is, you know, and it, and it just kind of really goes back to the the mystery, which no one's really ever given a concrete answer to of. Why would the tension that was brewing and the dynamics between the three of them, they, they all went on the boat together that weekend, you know, um, it, it it seems very unusual that they would have made this decision, no, knowing that there was tension and, and yeah. you know, jealousy and things like you that. You would think I mean, that Walken would have just said, hey, <laughs> I'm out, y'all. Yeah. 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 And apparently they had invited other people. So originally it was supposed to be a larger group, but the weather was going to be bad. Um, so a lot of people backed out at the last minute. And then, but those three decided they were, you know, and, and, you know, from what people say, being that the weather was going to be bad and it was just kind of a, an ill-fated idea, I think in a lot of people's opinion, just, just even looking at it from the outset, people did try to talk them out of it, but they were very hard to talk them out of it. Yeah. 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 Um, He's like, I don't think this is a good idea. And Natalie was like, no, we're doing it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's flip gears. We've, uh, we're getting low in time. Let's talk about Wigwam as far as the Elvis story goes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> I've interviewed a lot of folks and I know y'all have interviewed folks. Y'all been doing uh, some videos on the Elvis story. And wow. I mean, yeah. It's just such a crazy story. Yeah. And you don't know a lot of times who to believe. Um, yeah. You know, I've gotten mixed messages from just about every person that I've interviewed. And yeah. so I, what what do y'all think is the motivation for that? Is it self-preservation of your part of the story? What What is this? I you know, think it's a little bit of everything, honestly. You know, um, my, my take on it, how I kind of approach this is I'm like, I take everybody with a grain of salt. You know, I, I don't go into this wholeheartedly believing anybody. And my, my theory is like, just line it all up, see what matches up, you know, <laughs> you know, just see what mm -hmm. the end result is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that people have a lot of different motives for that. One is some people want to expand their role in the story a little bit, or they want to minimize someone else's role. That's a huge part of it right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, another, another piece of that is even, even if they're not trying to expand their uh, part of it, you know, Sometimes people it's like they're flattered that that they're being interviewed or something, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, well, you want to have something good to say, something interesting to say, you know. So s slowly, the truth gets a little compromised through the retelling, even if it's not for selfish reasons, you know. Because mm -hmm. you want to say, you know, it it'll be better if I juice it up a little bit, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I theorized, and I've said this before. So if y'all have heard this before, forgive me. Um, the uh, I've theorized that that during Elvis's lifetime, and we're talking about people in the Memphis Mafia, people in that in that realm, and not necessarily Memphis Mafia, but people that are in that circle. Um, those people were constantly, um, uh, uh, what's the, what's the right word for it? They were um, jockeying for position is a is a nice way to say yeah. it. I think okay. So yeah. while Elvis was alive, they were jockeying for position because there's only so much Elvis to go around. I mean, he's one yeah. guy, there's a lot of people and everybody yeah. wants to be that person. Sure. When, yeah. when Elvis passed away, that jockeying for position went back to zero and then the media started. So what are they doing? They're immediately going to Memphis Mafia. They're immediately going to these people and they're asking them questions. And for a lot of them, it was probably questions they didn't know the answer to, but you don't want to be the guy that goes, I don't know. Exactly. So they yeah. will start exactly. saying things because Elvis is dead. Nobody's going to be able to in 40 years, uh, especially knuckleheads that are on YouTube, go to the archives and pull up newspaper articles and be able to figure out <laughs> what movies were playing when and, and where and all that kind of stuff. You know, nobody's ever going to figure this out. So I think they just said stuff. And that's yeah, why. Because you, you read, like you said. You re you read their inter you read their book you watch an interview and none of it matches up because they were just saying stuff and they never knew anybody would ever figure it out. Nobody ever said I don't know. No, they didn't. Nobody. You know? did. And yeah. if they did, it didn't make it on the air. 
That's exactly right. You know, yeah. But I think oh, that I know really about, what yeah. led to a lot of this was they literally were jockeying for a position with the media, wanting to be that guy True. that they kept coming back to. And so they just said stuff. And, and I, an example I would give, and I'm not going to say who said this, but an example was, and I've said this before on the podcast, is there was a story told that, uh, that the question was asked, did Elvis ever watch Star Wars? The answer was, oh, no, we tried to get it and we couldn't get it. Well, I went back to the archives and Star Wars was playing at the Memphian, which was arguably Elvis's favorite movie theater, had been playing for two months at the time that Elvis died. So that's just simply not true. Now, in the yeah. later years, 76, 77, Elvis was not going into town to the Memphian. He had found the Whitehaven Plaza and found Southbrook 4. So he was watching things more out there. But if they really wanted to see it, they could have gone into town to the Memphian. It was already there. There was nothing to do but just go. You know, so I just think that's one of those one-offs where they just went, oh, no, we, we tried to get it. We couldn't. They just said it. Yeah. You know. I think also sometimes people, it's like they hear other people say something so much that you kind of get implanted in memory and you mm -hmm. think you were there, even mm -hmm. though you really weren't, or you think you have a memory because you've heard people talk about mm -hmm. it so much, you know? And so I think that happens sometimes. Um, I think I also think that's there's a big part of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 You know, cause it's like, you we've all heard so these much, old stories. I've heard them so many times. Like sometimes I could imagine it like I was there cause I've just yeah. read them so much, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. And I think for people who actually were around during that time, when you hear these stories over and over again, it's easy to start getting confused with what you actually remember and what you've heard people say a million times, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, I mean, memories fail, you know, I mean, like my grandfather always used to say, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. And I really can't. <laughs> so, yeah. I yeah. I mean, Thank when people much. go back, you know, 50, 60 years, I mean, you know, so that means we got three minutes left, but I okay. mean, we can go a little bit over that since, since we're, we're doing well. But yeah, I mean, on expanding on what you just said, I can remember going to uh, Memphis and the, you've got the, the core key things of Elvis in Memphis. That would be Graceland, of course, uh, Memphis Recording Service, known as Sun Studios, Lauderdale, uh, uh, Memphis uh, Funeral Home, where the funeral happened at and all that kind of stuff. All these little key things, Liberty Land. So I can remember um, when I started filming the Elvis stuff again, uh, I, st I did it in the 80s and a little bit in the 90s, but then I started again in like 20, what, 15, 2016. And so when I started doing that again, I thought, man, I've got to go to Lauderdale. I've never been there and I've got to go here and I've got, and then later I'm finding pictures of me at these places. <laughs> I had no recollection of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I, and here we all are asking people to yeah. remember something that happened 50 years ago and expecting them to give us a real answer. Yeah. And so I think that I don't think that a lot of these people are with intent lying. And I don't even like to use the right. word lying, but I think with intent giving us information, false information would be the nicer way to say it. I don't think they're doing anything yeah. with intent. But the reality is, is if you don't know, don't say it is, you know, yeah. because I want to know what really happened. And I know y'all do, too. And for us, when we're trying to figure something out, man, it makes it hard because you're throwing all these false things out there that we've yeah. got to sift through to try to get to the real what really happened. And, man, it is a minefield. Yeah, it's, that's the same thing with the Natalie story, not to go back, but just to say, you know, they've thrown so much out there. The water is so muddied. I mean, that's exactly, you know, what they needed to, to have happen. You know, I, mean, mm -hmm. it, I was going to say, I think another thing that plays into that, too, are different perceptions. Like, you know, with my personality, I might value or want to see something a certain way. So I'm really going to explain it this way. But Daniel, you might believe something else about it. So you're going to explain it a different way, you know, and that might be a reflection of our personalities, you know, you know what I mean? And and what we wanted yeah. to be true versus what was. I think mm -hmm. that happens sometimes. Or something um, that that's made a big impression. But that's why when you're investigating a story, you try to get as many viewpoints as you can and then you take the pieces that line up between all those viewpoints and that's 
close to what really happened. There's some truth there. Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. we all have this Elvis narrative in our head and I can't remember where I got these facts from. I got yeah. them from nowhere and everywhere over time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sources, you know, yeah. but, but you know, it's just, it's a construct, you know, it's not any one story. It's yeah. just what you can make of everything you've learned. I and think- I- Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say also, I think sometimes looking at when these stories were told and what motivation somebody might have had for wanting to explain it this particular way, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think that like it's interesting, too, because it's like a lot of that gets lost with the wash of time where like we can't really remember, OK, maybe this person was wanted to emphasize this because this other person had said that and, mm-hmm. you know, they wanted to kind of correct that or. Um, something like that, you know, but it's like over time, you kind of forget who said what, when, and who might have been trying to correct what, and that kind of thing. And I think that just kind of, you know, it just all meshes together at some point yeah. and it's hard to tease the, out. The other thing that kind of bothers me with this whole story is there's there's this correction thing that you're talking about where this one person goes, oh, no, that's not what happened. And that person's a liar and you can't believe anything that they say. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? If they yeah, weren't thinking that true. far. And, and, you know, they wanted, they were not even there. What are they talking about? These horrible people, you know, yeah. he, ha- he hated them on top of all that, you know, yeah. so you got, yeah. it's like, guys, what are y'all talking about? So well, like, um, everyone's so defensive and, and, and they own their little piece of the story and they're, they're very jealous of it. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's kind of goes back to the Robert Wagner thing. You know, I'm so jealous of this. I'm going to kill you for it. You know, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, I love you so much that I'm going to take you out of the picture. So, you know, so it's all it's all quite a bizarre thing. But but Wigwam is real. Wishing Cotton was a monkey. The, the idea that that there's people out there that pretend things that they know are not true or true for relationship would be one for position for. I mean, what other variables can y'all think of? Relationships, a big thing. But yeah. I don't say I had a situation where, and I don't want to bring up uh, uh, kind of a negative thing, but I had a situation where going back to the movie, the Elvis's last movie at the Southbrook Four, we had a person, and off camera I'll share this with y'all. We had a person that wrote and said, "I was there. I know that it happened at the Southbrook Four, but I can't tell." such and such because they're my friend and I don't want to offend them. Mm-hmm. You see what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So that's a, yeah. that's an example of someone knowing the truth, but not being willing to come yeah, yeah. forward because they oh. don't want to mess up some kind of a relationship with someone. And yeah, so yeah. I think that's a delicate balance. You know, there's things that I don't say that I know because I don't want to, to mess up the Elvis story. You know, I don't want to mess up his image any worse than it's been destroyed by a lot of things. Um, and just because, and, but when I say I know it, I also don't know it because I wasn't there. So you've got to trust that what this person told you is factual. So there's so many pieces to that. And one of the yeah, things yeah, that I've yeah. done is I've started going back um, to my original videos that I did starting at the very, very beginning and taking those videos, pulling them in, and updating them with new information, new video that I have, new photographs, also listening to what I said back then. And what I've done is I've learned a lot of new things now that I thought were true then that I found out are not true now, or I don't believe them. And so you go back and you listen, you go, my God, I can't believe I just said that. What was I thinking? So this already happened to you. So what happens is over this long period of time and learning and meeting people and interviewing and finding out all these other details, especially in a story as big as the Elvis story and as long, I mean, it was 22 years and there's a lot of players and a lot of things you learn new stuff. And so I've tried to go back and update those videos. And there's people out there that say that I have other motives for the reason that I'm doing this. But there's, I don't have any motive other than I want it to be as accurate as it can be. Plus, I was not as good at, at making the videos back then as I am now. You know, I'm not saying I'm good at it, but I'm just saying that I have a lot more experience now. So I do things like with my voice, 
when I'm voicing over something back then, there was a lot of me talking and going, ah, uh, or, and, you know, while I'm trying to think of the next thing I'm going to say. So what I'm doing now is I'll take a clip, I'll pull it out, I'll pull the vocal out and I'll cut the and and the arm out. I'll take all those spaces out. So if you listen to the new version of my videos, you don't notice it, but it's one constant stream of, of me talking without spaces. Yeah. And, yeah. I try, and you have to leave enough space to make the, the, the end word and the beginning word work as far as it's not a run on sentence. But I've gone back and done that. And it'll shorten clips by three or four seconds sometimes where I was going, uh, and, uh, yeah. you yeah. know, so I'm taking all those things out. Where when I made those videos, that didn't bother me. Now right. when I listen to it, I go, "Oh, what was I doing?" <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so we're looking forward to cringing at standard you know, has gotten higher, you know now. Yeah. And so, and but y'all experienced that. Y'all been doing this what maybe two years? Really, I think just a year, isn't it? Hey, um, so let's say a year, and you've already experienced where you said something that you found out not to be factual in a very short period of time. Yeah. But you didn't, oh, make, yeah. you didn't say that with intent. That's what you thought was the truth at the time, right? Yeah. yeah. I've got, we've got a couple of correction videos out there and, uh, and, you know, maybe something else I'm thinking about, you know, but well, yeah, I mean. Yeah. I've just said something. And then after I said it, I was like, well, that's not true. I don't even know what, you know, it's like you even flub sometimes without yeah. necessarily meaning to, but you, you know, know there've been. <laughs> and the other thing that you have, uh, Carrie, and I didn't mean to step on you, but the other oh, thing sure. you have is people that, that are knowledgeable that watch your videos and go, Hey, I just wanted you to know that this, you know, you said this, but I want you to know about this. But I think for me, a lot of that in the early days, uh, uh, people didn't know how to approach it. And what I mean is they couldn't contact you and go, Hey man, you said this in this video. And I don't think what you said was factual. Let me tell you why they don't do that. They go, Hey, you sob, what are you doing? You man, you you're a terrible yeah. person. Why would you do? You know, it's. Yeah. I think a lot of it is in the way that they approach it. If they would just come to you and go, "Hey, I don't think you got that right. Let me tell you why." But that'd be great. My experience was not that at all. It well, was. Yeah, I mean, you're the worst person in the world because you said that. You know, and that's that's the thing about about our channel that we're trying to lay the track for early on is that, you know, we'll never get rid of your comment because of your opinion. Right. The only, the only thing that would get you booted off is demeanor, rudeness, that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. if you could say whatever you want, just say it respectfully, you yeah. know, and non-combatively and, and, and it stays, you know, because your opinion is your opinion. I mean, we should be, you know, we should be reasonable about it. I mean, yeah. I, and if you've got, if you found something that's wrong, please, we, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah. You know, it's just. Now, it's, people can't do that objectively. They want to just tear you down. You know, some can't yeah. or some won't, but yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And even if you disagree, I mean, there have been people who have disagreed with something we said, but they've been really, you know, but, but Hey, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm just agreeing. We're very nice about you, it. And we get into a conversation. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's and fine. Just because you know? they correct you does not mean that they're correct either. I've had people correct me on things that I go, I'm sorry, but I, I believe what I said is, it stands. You know, yeah. and they get mad. How dare you leave? You know, you I told you what was right. You know, so you get yeah. that. So it's a balance. You have to balance all of it. But yeah, um, it's do. also therapeutic to block people. Just remember that. <laughs> so so yeah. there is that. Well, some people, if they're not going to play nice, I mean, yeah. then you don't get to play. I mean, yeah, it is well, what it know, is. For yeah. our uh, our mental health, you have to get rid of some of that negativity because yeah. you know there's 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 a standard and some people will, you know, there's a line and some people go over that line and some of them don't do it right away. They'll, you know, to be a little thing. Cause I can see people putting messages in there and I go <laughs> well, running right up to the line, but one day they step over it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but yeah. they, they usually, and it's usually a person that comments a lot. They'll suddenly jump in there and they'll put five comments on one video. And then you'll start noticing that they're commenting, you know, they'll start grabbing videos and why well, this, this and that, and they're nitpicking things. And so, yeah. you know, it's a mental health thing for me. It helps yeah. me to, to block people. And I had to teach Trey about that because yeah. he was letting people just kind of beat up on him. You know, I was like, block, 
It's easy to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like if, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, they've got, if they've got something, you don't have to agree. You just have to be nice, yeah. you know, yeah. or at least not be rude. Yeah. Don't <laughs> be destructive. Be constructive. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It'd be nice to the other commentators too. I I don't yeah. like it when somebody attacks like a comment somebody else wrote another viewer. You know, I they you know it's like go too. after the yeah. viewers. That's, They'll do that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, well, thank y'all so much for this. And look, we're going to do this again soon. I Absolutely. really I really enjoyed it. Uh, great job, y'all. Oh, and thank you. Friends, so y'all go check their channel out, Trav Elvis. And y'all have got, it's not only Elvis stuff, there's a variety of things, which I've started doing a variety of things as well, and Trey has as well. Yeah. Um, but man, thank y'all so much for doing this. this was, it was a lot of fun. And yes. I'm going to go study this. Uh, now you've got me interested in this story. I want to know about, you know, I'm from North Carolina, and I was not an hour from where they were filming that if it was in yeah. Raleigh, Durham. In 1981, I was in high school. Okay. There. So I want to go figure out where all that happened at. That's very interesting. There There's is a, a scene I know for yeah. <laughs> and so I know good. for sure they did film a scene at the dunes um in the outer banks, uh the sand dunes. I yeah, on um oh, Kitty Hawk. Hill Devil Hills. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Wright Brothers thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. And the governor's yeah. in and there's a restaurant there. I, I think it's called the uh, uh I can't remember now. You're talking about the governor's inn in Raleigh? Yeah. Okay. The the okay. the um so did the, the movie cast ever get crew, finished? Cast and crew stayed there. Did the movie ever get finished? It yes. did get finished. So yeah. they had yeah. enough in the can to do the movie. They yes, had they enough did. to complete yeah. it. They had to do a little, you know, finagling, but the they, they yeah. were able to yeah. Okay. And it's their last movie. Yep. Yeah, yep. interesting. Well, guys, we're a little bit over, but it's all right. It was all, it was good stuff, and thank y'all so much for doing this. Of course, and we yeah, will, we will do it again soon. It was our Absolutely. pleasure. Sir. Thank y'all for watching. Make sure you check their channel, Trav Elvis, out, and tighten up every chance you get.